On July 20th, 1969, humanity reaches a new frontier. Now, nothing seems impossible. In a Toronto suburb, June Callwood wants her youngest son, Casey, to cherish the moment. We had an outlet in our garage, and I carried out our television set and plugged it in. Instead of putting him to bed, the two of us sat there, side by side, and we watched Armstrong land, put his foot down on the moon. We could see the moon up above us. It was magical. The two of us knew we would remember it for the rest of our lives. After that, I thought that civilization was going to get nicer. In Alberta, Mike Steinhauer, a Cree, also watches, but what he sees foreshadows an ominous future. These are some of the prophecies of our people, that in time a white man was going to go to the moon and would make the spirit in the moon angry. I knew that things would never be the same again. That same night in the Gas Bay, 20-year-old Lise Balsé and other young revolutionaries are not watching television. It's not what's going on in space that interests them. It's what's happening on Earth. Many colonized countries were struggling for their independence. We felt part of that international movement. Our cause was for an independent Quebec. This is the story of a time when anything seems possible. When progress has become a religion. When people believe there are no bounds to the inventiveness of human beings. A time when the young do their own thing and want to save the world. When women fight for equal rights and First Nations claim their ancestral heritage. This is the moment when Canada asserts its identity to the world just as it slides into one of the worst crises in its history. A time when Canadians must choose between conflicting visions of their future, and when excess of all kinds leads to a sobering awakening. mid-1960s in small cities like Orillia, Ontario, summer is a wonderful time to be young. In the past few years, the young have been coming here by the thousands. Not everybody is thrilled to see them. They went down to our beautiful uh, Lake Kutchising Beach Park. They slept on the park. They drove their cars over the park lawn and when they got to drinking, they broke their bottles up against our beautiful uh, Champlain Monument. Of course, there are a few people uh, who think that anyone who wears a beard is a beatnik, which uh, 
is not so. These were all college and university students. They're here for the Mariposa Folk Festival to hear rising stars like Ian and Sylvia. Folk music is the new craze. It's simpler, more authentic than rock and roll. Sharon Hampson was 17 when she left high school to become a folk singer. She performs at the first Mariposa concerts. It was a laid back, a pleasurable environment. People were just happy. There was a sense of camaraderie of people being in it together, sharing an experience. This is music with a message. Performers like Nova Scotian Al Cromwell stoke the fires of a generation's youthful idealism. For Sharon Hampson, it's a call to action. I grew up in an environment of political action, so the idea of people singing together about social issues was not unusual for me. What was outstanding for me was that it was becoming mainstream. I felt that there was power in people working together to make the world a better place. It's a new egalitarian culture. In smoky coffee houses like Toronto's Bohemian Embassy, the young poet Margaret Atwood tries out her work. It wasn't very big and it was nice and dark in there. And also there were people who were worse than you, but I have to say not by much. You clapped when they read, and they clapped when you read. Come, my brothers. Let us govern Canada. Let us find our serious heads. From Bob Dylan to Leonard Cohen, art has become a form of subversion and revolution. Let us dump asbestos on the White House. <laughs> Let us encourage the dark races so they'll be lenient when they take over. In the mid-60s, more Canadians than ever, over 200,000, attend university. It is here they are exposed to different and sometimes radical ideas. They found groups like the Student Union for Peace Action, which becomes the core of a movement, the New Left. James Laxer at Queen's University in Kingston is part of it. Being young was everything in this society. It was huge. And being young meant you had power. And you didn't hesitate to tell people in the older generation what was what. And many students like Laxer are awakened to nationalism. In a seminal book, philosopher George Grant warns that Canada is losing its identity. The British fact in Canada did make people know very clearly, in a clear way. They, they took for granted, it was in their, in their bellies, whatever it was, that they were different from Americans. Now, a lot of Canadians now do not see the difference. Laxer reads it through the night. I was already in some sense a nationalist, but this gave me a coherent view that there was a consistent body of ideas that distinguished Canada from the United States and made Canada a country worth saving. In 1965, you no longer need a philosopher to see the difference. America goes to war in Vietnam. This distant war will touch the hearts and minds of a whole generation. It is not a time for diatribe. It is a time for dialogue. The world is changing, but not in the way they had hoped. In Quebec, a new homegrown culture is flowering. It's in the Boite à Chanson with Claude Gauthier, Pauline Julien, and Gilles Vigneault. 
Seismic changes are happening everywhere. In a span of 10 years, half the population turns its back on the church. The very existence of Canada is now openly challenged. A quarter of Quebecers now favor independence. The Lesage government is swept up in this tide of rising expectations, and René Lévesque is right at the heart of it. The government's first target, private power companies. C'est au peuple du Québec de prendre dans ses mains, librement et fièrement, la première et la plus importante de toutes les clés d'une économie moderne. Et ça, ça veut dire la nationalisation de l'électricité. This is an open challenge to the English private companies that had been coddled under the long Duplessis regime. The plan is wildly popular. In some rural areas, the cost of power is three times what it is in Montreal, and sometimes it's unreliable. The 11 private power companies fight back. J.A. Fuller, president of Shawinigan Power, warns. The idea that a state-owned monopoly would automatically bring greater efficiency and lower rates is a fallacy. Government opponents insinuate that Levesque is another Fidel Castro. But the floodgates are open. The government finds itself spearheading a quiet revolution. And no one knows where it will lead. Since the very first days of New France, the Catholic Church has educated the young. In the early 60s, half leave school before they are 15. It is one of the worst dropout rates in Canada. Juliette Gagnon taught for many years in a rural Quebec school. Here in the country, it was the exception that could go on beyond sixth grade. People said that to pick up rocks and work the land, they didn't need an education. Micheline Poirier is growing up in a working class Montreal neighborhood. I was the youngest in a family of 10 children. My parents were blue collar workers. I was hoping to go on to higher education, but my parents didn't have the money. Claude Briette is a priest teaching in a classical college near Montreal. Our mission was to train the elite. We had some sons of working class people. To be able to get financial help, they had to have a recommendation from the parish priest. The first outcry comes from a teaching brother. The impertinences of Brother Anonymous excoriates the quality of public education. It is a huge bestseller. His name is Jean-Paul Desbien, and his criticism is not appreciated by the church. His order sends him off to Europe for three years of reflection. Education becomes the Lesage government's next crusade. It sets out to wrest control from the church. Youth Minister Paul Gérin Lajoie is assigned to do it. We were concerned by the reality of the moment, and this reality was brutal and easy to see. Quebec's education system was not up to the needs of the 20th century. Bishop Maurice Roy, the primate of the Catholic Church in Canada, defends the church's historic hold on education. There are, in this great enterprise, established a hundred years ago, guiding principles that cannot be changed without endangering its solidity. But the government refuses to back down. Within a few years, a new system is born. Huge comprehensive high schools spring up everywhere. Claude Briette has left his small classical college and now teaches in Montreal. I arrived at Edouard Montpetit High School the year it opened. I was coming from a school of 300 students to one where there were almost 2,000 of them. What a difference. 
But the education reform upsets a way of life that is centuries old. In the countryside, Juliette Gagnon sees the mood change. What people complained most about was the introduction of new taxes. They started calling Mr. Lesage, Tijan la tax. Maurice Duplessis's old party, the Union Nationale, feeds off the resentment. In the countryside, it lashes out against the yellow peril, the school buses that pick up farm children at dawn and bring them home after dark. In 1966, the Union Nationale upsets Lesage's liberals. But the new premier, Daniel Johnson, will not turn back the clock. The quiet revolution will go on. Progress has become a religion. In its name, politicians, social engineers, and urban planners are reshaping the country. The sky is the limit. They believe they can alter nature. And displace entire populations. W.A.C. Bennett is Premier of British Columbia. He opens the interior to forestry and mining companies. He builds highways, launches huge hydroelectric projects. One of his mega projects is the damming of the Columbia River to generate power for the American market. The deal brings the province $275 million in its first 30 years. Now this is great for Canada and great for British Columbia. This is no sellout. This is a genuine good business deal. But one of the dams threatens to flood 600 families, some whose ancestors settled there at the turn of the century. If somebody could kill me off and the land would still be safe, I would very willingly uh, finish my birthday. day. But they can do nothing against an all-powerful government. 2,500 men, women, and children must leave. At the other end of the country, Newfoundland Premier Joey Smallwood is moving people too. The outports, small fishing villages all along the coast, are being closed down. Entire villages take to the sea. The residents and their homes are being relocated in larger communities. Some 250 outports vanish, and 30,000 people are resettled. I think we will get through better here, because it is work for the children. I'm getting settled down now. We have a new home. And eventually, I'll get a car. So if I hold my health, I'll be thankful. This is our new land, and this is our new home. Everything will be okay. I'm quite contented now with what I'm going to do in any case. Quite contented with it. The old days is over. Now they will have roads, electricity, and schools. But it is the end of a way of life that endured for centuries. What can I do? I never worked on the land. I went on the water when I was 13 years old, now I'm 60. It's happening in cities too. In Toronto and Montreal, whole neighborhoods, mostly working class, are raised in the name of progress. In Halifax, it's the city's oldest black neighborhood that is targeted. Over the hills and 
Some families have been here for more than 150 years. Many are descendants of American slaves who fled north to Nova Scotia. Go tell it on the years of official neglect and racism have made Africville one of the worst slums in the country. The city decides the residents must be moved. In terms of the physical conditions of buildings and sanitation, the story is deplorable. There are only two things to be said. The families will have to be rehoused in the future. The land, which they occupy, will be required for the future development of the city. But to its people, Africville is a community. For young Terry Dixon, it is a warm and safe place. Anywhere you go, anywhere you fall down, you hurt yourself, you don't have to go home. You just go to the nearest house and have that taken care of. Africville's residents are not wealthy, but they are proud. Most believe that they own their land and the house in which they live. You're in this country and you own a piece of property, you're not a second class citizen. But very few actually have a deed to prove their ownership. They are stunned when they learn they must leave. Halifax Mayor John Edward Lloyd justifies the city's decision by invoking the end of segregation and humanitarian reasons. And sometimes, some people need to be shown that certain things are not in their own best interest. What is being done, or what is being done in the total public interest, including the best welfare of these people themselves and their children. The residents find out the city doesn't recognize their property claim. It offers most of them only symbolic compensation for their land and homes. Daisy Carvery, a mother of five, is enraged. They got the older people together because they simply knew that the older people didn't have any education. What is $500 to a 75-year-old Negro? He thinks he's rich. They took our homes. They moved us out of Africville. The city moved us out of Africville in the city garbage trucks. Eventually, all had to leave. The last to go was 72-year-old Aaron Paw Carvery. The day I left my home, part of me inside died. If I had been a little younger, the city would never have gotten my land. In the early 60s, many women have jobs, but on average, most earn two-thirds of what men earn for the same work. Most working women are single. A female boss is a rare bird indeed. Doris Anderson wants to be editor of Chatelaine magazine, but it looks as if a man will get the job. They thought, oh well, she's getting married and she'll be quitting, but uh, I said I want the job and uh, I'm not going to work for anyone else, so uh, they gave me the job. A year later, she is pregnant. It's considered inappropriate for an obviously pregnant woman to be at work. Her boss feels businessmen working in the same building will be embarrassed by her presence. To keep her job, Doris promises to be discreet. I'll come and go at odd hours, so I won't be too conspicuous. But even that won't do. She keeps the job, but she can't be seen. I worked from home. The staff was running back and forth in cabs with layouts and photographs and artwork. It was ridiculous. The next time she's pregnant, she tells no one. When her boss inevitably notices, he confronts her. 
He said, when are you going home? I said, I'm going home the day after I have this baby. He threw up his hands and didn't do anything about it. And by the time I had my third child, there were pregnant women all over McLean Hunter. Life is even tougher for women in politics. In the last 40 years, a handful of women have been elected to office. It's 1957 before a woman, Ellen Fairclough, becomes a federal cabinet minister. In Quebec, women face unusual hurdles. In 1961, lawyer Claire Kirkland Casgrain is the first woman elected to the legislature. I was considered a bit of a novelty. Who was this woman who had dared to run for a political party and had managed to get elected? What did she have to say? What did she think? And unfortunately, what will she wear? Fashion is the least of her problems. She needs to rent an apartment in Quebec City. But as a married woman, she has the same legal status as a child. The landlord won't deal with her. My husband had to sign the contract to make it legal. I was a member of the legislature and a lawyer, but I could not sign a lease. Under Quebec's civil code, married women are deemed incapable. They cannot open a bank account or authorize medical care for their children. Claire Kirkland Casgrain now can do something about that. Cette notion de la puissance paternelle est dépassée depuis longtemps et qu'il est temps de lui substituer un concept nouveau, celui de la puissance parentale qui viendra consacrer le caractère d'association, le caractère de partnership qui doit exister entre l'homme et la femme au sein d'une famille bien organisée. She gets the law changed. By 1964, married women in Quebec are no longer treated as minors. But it's science that will truly revolutionize women's lives. In 1961, a new pill appears on the Canadian market. Officially, the pill is prescribed to regulate the menstrual cycle. But its inventor, Dr. John Rock, concedes it does have other side effects. The pill can be used for its other effects to relieve uh, several common complaints of women. Uh, and uh, if unfortunately in, in, uh, in doing this, it, the woman becomes infertile while she's taking the pill, well, that's too bad. And no matter how pleased she is to be infertile. There is good reason to be cautious. It is illegal in Canada to promote or to give out any information about birth control. The same year the pill becomes available, Toronto pharmacist Harold Fine is sentenced to a month in jail or a hundred dollar fine for distributing birth control information. The Catholic Church condemns both birth control and abortion under pain of excommunication. Many women don't know where to turn. In 1962, a young mother who wants to remain anonymous is in trouble. She lives near Toronto and has six children. Her doctor is a practicing Catholic, so she doesn't dare ask him for the pill. Pregnant again, she panics. Our youngest daughter was two years old. I felt as if I could see the light at the end of the tunnel. I was 32. I felt that we had enough children. I thought, I can't do this. I just felt mentally and physically exhausted. I was devastated. She looks for a doctor willing to do an abortion. All she can find is advice from a neighbor who is a medical intern. He said, this is a very dangerous thing to do. You could have an embolism. He said, you could try many, many douches with soap suds. 
All I was thinking about was, I'm not going to go through with this pregnancy. For the next three days, once every hour, she gambles with her life. I was crazy. I never should have done it. A couple of my kids were home. In desperate situations, women do desperate things. I was thinking, I've got to keep doing this until something happens. When I saw the menstrual blood, I was so happy and relieved. If it had been feasible, I would have opened the bathroom window and shouted, I'm not pregnant. She is by no means alone. It is estimated that in 1963, some 75,000 Canadian women, most of them housewives, had illegal abortions. Nearly half were in Toronto. In the 1960s, about 120 women die of abortions. Each year, more than 30,000 women require hospital treatment as a result of an abortion. The women's movement will make access to legal abortions its next big battle. In the early 1960s, the nation's capital is not very welcoming to Francophones. Ottawa is resolutely English, and English is the working language at all levels of the federal government. Prime Minister John Diefenbaker has his own vision of what it means to be Canadian. I'm the first Prime Minister of this country to have neither altogether English or French origin. So I determined to bring about a Canadian citizenship that knew no hyphenated consideration. Journalist André Laurendeau watches and worries. Is it only by coincidence that Quebec separatism has gained in importance during Mr. Diefenbaker's tenure? I don't think so. In 1962, Diefenbaker is re-elected but Quebecers vote massively for the opposition Liberals and for a new party, Réal Cahouette's Creditists. Donnons aux hommes, aux femmes et aux enfants du Canada le pouvoir d'achat. There are almost no francophones in federal institutions. It's an explosive situation. Donald Gordon, the president of the Canadian National Railways, sets off the spark. Once a year, he has to report on the railway's activities to a House of Commons committee. This particular year, 1962, he is ambushed by creditist MP Gilles Grégoire. Grégoire holds up the CNR's annual report. I note we have one president, 17 vice presidents and 10 directors, and none of these is French-Canadian. Gordon has an answer. As far as I am personally concerned, and as I am the president of the CNR, there is not going to be a promotion or an appointment made just because a man is French-Canadian. He has got to be a French-Canadian plus other things, and he has to be as able as the other fellow who has a claim on the job. Later, Gordon tries to soften his remarks. The plain fact is that the railway industry has not, in the past, been an attractive industry for French Canadians on the record. Now, it's, it's one thing to open the door, and it's quite another thing to get people to come through it. But he has outraged French Canadians everywhere. For André Laurendeau, Gordon is stating the obvious. Mr. Gordon has this quality. He is brutally frank. He says very loudly what others do just as well as he does, only without saying so. 23 federal organizations out of 78 practice the same total exclusion. Lorando calls for a royal commission on the conditions of French Canadians in Canada. It's the night of May 16, 1963, at Gérard Pelletier's house in Westmount. Three men are chatting, Pelletier, Laurent Do, and René Lévesque. It's almost 2 a.m. Pelletier races out. 
Already the tenants in the neighborhood are out in their nightshirts. Suddenly a large woman cries out, the mailbox, there was a mailbox here. It begins to down on us. René becomes very agitated. Let's go see elsewhere, he says. There were three explosions, no? I want to see where the other bombs went off. It's the old reporter in him. It's like he smells a scoop. On that May evening, 10 bombs have been placed in mailboxes in Westmount. For more than two months now, the Front de Libération du Québec has been setting off bombs. Most of the targets are symbols of the British monarchy. Laurando is deeply shaken. I compare them to wild beasts who have escaped from their cages, who lurk in some dark corner and who will, if this keeps up, spread terror through the city. Terrorism is now part of the political landscape. In 1963, Lester Pearson's liberals are elected. One of the first things he does is appoint a royal commission on bilingualism and biculturalism. To head it, he appoints Davidson Dunton, a former CBC president, and André Laurando. It will be the most painful experience of his life. Lester Pearson also believes the country needs its own national symbols. Canada has existed for 97 years, but it still uses the red ensign as its flag. In Winnipeg, before the Canadian Legion, he pitches his vision. I believe that today a flag designed around the maple leaf will symbolize and be a true reflection of the new Canada. He is in for a fight. Oh, I don't think that that'll lead the cause of any unity. I think that that'll be controversial for many, many decades to come. We can live under the same flag we've been living under ever since Canada existed, as far as I'm concerned. One that. British flag, right? Oh, I think you should have maybe two flags. Be nice. In Quebec, it's not an issue. Non, il est grand temps qu'on puisse avoir un drapeau, franchement, vis-à-vis les autres pays, parce qu'on a donné un peu à l'hier, autrement dit. It is in this supercharged atmosphere that Parliament begins the flag debate. John Diefenbaker leads the charge against Pearson. Out with a red ensign. In uh, with the three maple leaves. Canadians are invited to use their imagination and talent. A parliamentary committee will look at more than 2,000 designs. On December 14th, 1964, Canada gets its own unique flag. Canada's existential crisis is very deeply rooted. It will require more than symbols to resolve it. Elections are set for 1965, and Pearson is looking for a new Quebec team. His first choice is Jean Marchand, a fiery labor leader. Marchand is afraid to go to Ottawa alone. He accepts only if Pelletier and university professor Pierre Trudeau are also candidates. Trudeau was not wanted. Less than two years before, he had virulently attacked Pearson over nuclear arms. His conversion to the party seems hasty and lukewarm. Je peux dire sincèrement que mes rencontres officielles avec le Parti libéral ou ses représentants, personnellement, remontent à hier. Ça fait même pas 24 heures. I thought um, that it was perhaps time for me to try and. Uh, stop criticizing others and start trying to do something. And if I succeed, well and good. And if I don't, I hope others will criticize me and I hope I will get the heck out of there if I can't do a good job. In the midst of a national crisis, Pearson has bet on three political rookies. Journalists dub them the three wise men. Nous devons avoir l'ambition de gouverner pour notre part 
le Canada dans son ensemble, parce que ce pays-là, dont d'aucuns ont l'air de croire qu'il appartient strictement aux gens qui parlent anglais, je suis convaincu qu'il appartient aussi et également aux gens qui parlent français. All three are elected, and in a very few years, their impact will be enormous. In many parts of the Atlantic provinces, the 60s bring on hard times. The economy is weak, unemployment high and rising. Many young people must choose between idleness and exile. Belle Island is the third largest city in Newfoundland. It's a one industry town. 12,000 residents depend on the iron mine, which has been operating for more than 60 years. Margaret Hines grows up there. My dad worked in the mines for years. Our life centered around the ironworks. That's where the work was. And as a child, my strongest memory is of the color of the iron ore. It's red, you see. And day after day, my mother would say, oh no, I hate to put the sheets out on the line. There's a wind. It was always windy. And the dust would get everything red. Then in 1966, the mine closes and the city begins to die. And the fishing wasn't doing well either, and everyone knew, you just knew that unless you were a professional teacher or a nurse or a doctor, there was no future for you in Newfoundland. It's a beautiful, beautiful island. It's not right. Margaret has a boyfriend, Hubert Butler, the 11th in a family of 12 children. I met him when I was still in high school, and we started dating. Then when he was 19, he decided to go to Ontario. It was a huge step because he'd never been away from home. Hubert first lands in the big city, Toronto. It's a strange feeling for a kid who comes from a place where everyone knows each other. Arriving at Toronto, looking at those buildings, you know, until you couldn't turn your neck any further. Me and me buddy Sweeney, both of us were very naive, didn't really have a clue what we were up against, and really thinking that the world was one big family. And we realized really fast that, you know, this isn't going to be quite as easy as you think, Spucko. But it is easy. Within a month, Hubert gets a job at the Ford plant in Windsor. The new auto pact with the United States is creating thousands of jobs. 90% of them are in southern Ontario. For the first time in history, Canada is exporting more cars than it's importing. Windsor's population grows by 50,000 in five years. Young men like Hubert Butler earn as much as an American auto worker. A few months later, he goes back to Belle Island to see Margaret. I could see the change in him, even in his clothing. And the hair was a little longer, a little fuller. And even some of the accent had rubbed off. But you could tell he was really enjoying himself. Hubert asks Margaret to come with him to Ontario. I knew that I had to decide, either go to Ontario or cut off the relationship. So I decided to go. I'd never been farther than St. John's, and I was so scared. And the thing that struck me first, as soon as I came out of the door to plane, was the air. In Newfoundland, the air's fresh, there's always a breeze. It was completely different, like being in a foreign land. They get married and honeymoon in Niagara Falls. Hubert and Margaret Butler will never go back to work in Newfoundland. 
five of Hubert's 11 brothers and sisters and all of Margaret's siblings will also leave Newfoundland to settle in other parts of Canada. You must realize as a Newfoundlander when you are raising your kid that there's a good chance he's going to have to move to some part of Canada or the United States to get a job. Between 1956 and 1973, almost one million people leave the Atlantic provinces. July 1st, 1967 is a time to celebrate. Well, here we go. Happy birthday, everybody! It seems for a while the country can forget all its troubles and enjoy itself. The whole world is invited to the party. More than 50 million people visit Montreal's World Fair, Expo 67. But at the end of July, a distinguished guest spoils the party. Charles de Gaulle, president of France and war hero, is one of the many world leaders invited that summer. His motorcade from Quebec City to Montreal is a triumph. It reminds him of his glory days. Tout le long de ma route, je me trouvais dans une atmosphère du même genre que celle de la libération. A huge, enthusiastic crowd has gathered around Montreal City Hall to greet him. Vive Montréal! Vive le Québec! Vive le Québec libre! Invited dignitaries, including René Lévesque, are stunned. In Ottawa, Pearson's reaction is diplomatic anger. Every province of Canada is free. Canadians do not need to be liberated. Canada will remain united and will reject any effort to destroy her unity. De Gaulle cuts short his trip and returns to France. But he has given indépendantistes like Pierre Bourgault an enormous boost. Parce que lui, pour la première fois en 200 ans, il est venu là sur notre terre. Je veux dire en français ce qu'il pensait. C'est le premier homme qui a gagné, qui est venu nous dire, lâchez pas. De Gaulle sends shockwaves through Quebec's political parties. Since losing the election, the Quebec Liberals have been tearing themselves apart. René Lévesque believes the party must assert Quebec's right to self-determination. L'examen de la réalité, il me semble, moi, dicte qu'il faut l'exercer ce droit-là le plus vite possible, qui est celui normal d'un peuple qui sent pas mal de, 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 de choses qui ne marchent pas, qui est bloqué devant un carrefour, de décider d'assumer de, un droit qu'il a. The Liberals don't listen to him. He quits the party. Lévesque's political future seems very uncertain. It is exactly the opposite for Pierre Trudeau in Ottawa. He has become Minister of Justice and the political mentor of the new generation. He introduces legislation to make divorce easier. He changes the criminal code to allow therapeutic abortions. And he decriminalizes homosexuality. The view we take here is that uh... There's no place for the state in the bedrooms of the nation, and I think that, uh, you know, what's done in private between adults uh, doesn't concern the criminal code. He lays out his vision of Canadian federalism. All individual citizens are to be treated equally. 
He is against any special status for Quebec, First Nations, or any other group. His views set him on a collision course with the Quebec government. When I talked about difficulty with the interlocutor, I didn't mean the federal government. Specifically, it was with the Minister of Justice. <laughs> He's become a media star. Here E. Trudeau, one, two, oh, three. A few months later, when Lester Pearson quits, Trudeau becomes liberal leader. Canada must be unified. Canada must be one. Canada must be progressive. And Canada must be a just society. The promise of a just society captures the imagination of the young generation. 1968 is not an election campaign, it's Trudeau-mania. I think he's the one that's going to, is going to do the best for Canada. Qu'est-ce que vous recherchez dans cet homme? Un homme qualifié comme M. Trudeau. But not everyone is a fan. For his last campaign event, Trudeau is to attend the Saint-Jean-Baptiste parade in Montreal. Pierre Bourgault and the Indépendantistes see his presence as an insult. Si nous protestons contre le fait qu'il soit au fait du Canada français, c'est que lui-même refuse d'accepter l'existence de la nation canadienne française ou québécoise comme telle. Trudeau ignores warnings of trouble and goes to the parade. It turns into a riot. A missile, apparently a bottle, was thrown into the main reviewing stand where Mr. Trudeau and other dignitaries were seated. Most dignitaries flee inside, but Trudeau won't go. He stays in his seat and watches the whole parade. Micheline Poirier, now a 22-year-old activist, is one of the rioters. We threw tomatoes, eggs at Trudeau. It wasn't Trudeau we were trying to hit. It was a symbol. 135 people are injured, 300 arrested, among them Pierre Bourgault. The next day, Trudeau easily wins the election. Canada has a strong majority government, and Trudeau is ready to take on his opponents. Ça a assez duré, les folies, depuis quelques années. On veut maintenant travailler ensemble pour faire un pays libre, un pays prospère et un pays uni. Fini, les folies. Soon, he will face life and death choices that will test his resolve. In the mid-60s, people everywhere are doing their own thing. Powerful institutions are under attack. Sometimes there's even revolution in the air. The long post-war boom comes crashing down. And the country faces its most divisive crisis of the century. I am confident that Quebecers will continue to reject separatism. Marshall McLuhan's global village is a reality. The young of the world have their own culture. Social taboos are flaunted. Micheline Poirier is only 23 years old, but already she is divorced. And now she is marrying a defrocked priest, Claude Brouillette, who is still teaching at his East End Montreal High School. To be divorced or to be defrocked was not considered right. Claude's family had a hard time dealing with it especially because his brother was defrocked the same year. But mentalities were changing. People felt more free to do their own thing. 
Never before has a young generation been so educated and so affluent. They don't hesitate to assert their rights and challenge authority. Lise Bausse, the niece of a former federal cabinet minister, is 19 when she quits her job to go back to school. In the fall of 1968, she is part of worldwide student uprisings. People said we were communists because we were challenging the system. We wanted to change society from top to bottom. We were protesting against everything, against poverty, capitalism, against every kind of injustice, every type of discrimination, all forms of exploitation. In the summer of 1969, Lise Balsé drifts down to Perse in the Gaspé Peninsula. She's joining a group of young revolutionaries at a fishing shack called La Maison du Pêcheur. It was very stimulating. We spent all of our time debating. We were reshaping the world. At that time, many countries were seeking their independence and we were all convinced that Quebec had to become independent too. It's there that she meets Paul Rose and joins the group that will become the chenier cell of the FLQ. Across North America, opposition to the Vietnam War radicalizes the young. Protest takes a thousand different forms. In Montreal, it's John Lennon's bed in for peace. We're here uh, as a protest against violence. Margaret Atwood uses poetry. It is dangerous to read newspapers. Each time I hit a key on my electric typewriter, speaking of peaceful trees, another village explodes. Voice of women members like Peggy Hope Simpson in Halifax knit sweaters for Vietnamese children. Even though I personally was a rotten knitter, we all knitted. Women were shocked to be told that small children in dark colors were less visible to snipers. I remember us knitting in very public places. It was a way of making the war sink into people's consciousness. Canadian women will knit and send 30,000 sweaters and children's blankets to Vietnam. In the United States, thousands of young men flee the country to avoid the draft. Between 1967 and 1974, more than 30,000 of them will come to Canada. Most settle around Vancouver and Toronto. For young Canadians like Patrick Moore, it's an opportunity to get directly involved. When I was at university, a group of friends was helping draft dodgers and deserters into Canada. It was the first time I was turned on to a kind of radical, socially activist thing. The young are becoming increasingly anti-American. Water and run along with the chaser. In 1969, Vancouver journalist Robert Hunter denounces American nuclear tests on Amchitka Island in Alaska. Sometime between tomorrow and October 15th, a 1.2 megaton atomic bomb will be triggered at the bottom of a 4,000 foot hole on the island. No one knows what the consequences will be. He is one of 7,000 protesters who shut down the main border crossing between BC and the US. They keep it closed for one hour. Hunter considers it a great victory. Not since the War of 1812 had the border between Canada and the United States been closed. So there was a, a sense of history in the air. But the Americans continue the nuclear tests. The next year, another Vancouver activist, Marie Bolin, has a different idea. Why doesn't somebody just sail a boat up there and park right next to the bomb? That's something everybody can understand. They rent a beat-up fishing boat the Phyllis Cormac, which they christen Greenpeace. Then they go looking for a crew. Robert Hunter signs on. I've been meaning to write this for ages. I guess you'd call it a formal application for passage on the Greenpeace. And I guess you've had quite a few such applications. There he meets crewmate Patrick Moore. 
I knew right away I wanted to join it. I wanted to do something. I wanted to do something about ecology and peace. With a dozen others, they become the crew for the first voyage of Greenpeace. They won't be able to stop the nuclear tests at Amchitka, but they attract worldwide media attention. We may have just looked like a little old fish boat, but in fact, we were cranking away at our typewriters and with our tape recorders. In a sense, we were a, a media warship. After the trip, some of the crew want to continue this kind of protest. The Greenpeace Foundation is born, and Hunter and Moore are its first co-presidents. Greenpeace became the first organization that linked the survival of the human race with the survival of the environment. Greenpeace will become the grand masters of environmental guerrilla action and the most visible environmental movement in the world. And 60s idealism is spreading throughout Canadian society. At the end of the decade, Canada's First Nations face a new threat from an unexpected quarter. Il faut faire comprendre aux Canadiens et singulièrement aux Indiens eux-mêmes que il faut un choix ou bien on entre dans la société canadienne de plein pied, on est égal de, devant la loi, on a les mêmes droits que les autres Canadiens ou alors on reste à part, on a des lois particulières et on est des citoyens un peu différents, pas des citoyens par entière. In a white paper, the Trudeau government proposes to abolish reserves, close their schools and integrate native children into white schools. Harold Cardinal is outraged. Now at a time when our fellow Canadians consider the promise of a just society, once more, the Indians of Canada are betrayed by a program which offers nothing better than cultural genocide. Cardinal is one of very few natives in Canada with a university education. He is only 24 when he becomes president of the Alberta Indian Association. The Indian people become like Indian Affairs, then they can govern themselves. Jean Chrétien is the Indian Affairs Minister who must implement Trudeau's policy. 200 Alberta chiefs, among them Harold Cardinal, immediately challenge the policy. It's an unprecedented show of political force. Until then, you saw native leaders in full regalia only when we danced for the Queen. There had never been a face-to-face -face meeting between the country's ministers and First Nations leaders. It was a breakthrough. They tell the government they want to control their own affairs. The first challenge occurs in Alberta. The federal government wants to close the Blue Quill School, which serves children from 11 reserves. It is run by Catholic priests and nuns. Stanley Redcrow has two children at the school. He is also the only native who works there. He is furious. This is our school. We can take it, we can run it ourselves. We won't need the sisters, and we don't need the priests for education. The parents ask Indian Affairs to let them run the school. Harold Cardinal supports them. Our theory was that if we had greater control over the educational system teaching us, if we were able to set up our own institution, we would have better success. The department won't budge. The parents decide they will take over the school. They set up camp in the schoolyard. They hold prayer meetings in the gymnasium. Natives across Canada rally to their cause. After two weeks, Jean Chrétien himself steps in. He challenges one of the mothers, Edith Memnuk. He asked me, how can you run a school with no education yourself? I told him, we'll do it, and we'll start by hiring our own educated people. 
The government gives in. The parents can run the school. Charles Wood, manager of the Saddle Lake Band, understands the difficult task facing them. When you have been told for years that Indian culture is no good, that our customs are pagan rites that must be banned, it's hard to feel you have any power. The first school board includes representatives from all 11 reserves. In September 1970, Blue Quill School becomes the first school in Canada managed and operated by Aboriginal people. Mike Steinhauer becomes its executive director. The first thing I did was take down all the crucifixes from the walls, all the traces of white religious domination in our education. For Margaret Queenie, a Frog Lake band counselor, their victory opens the way to a brighter future. We wanted to bring back Indian culture for the children, to give them back pride in their heritage. We're not gonna sit here and allow the white men to use and, and to make fun of us in this land of ours. The government withdraws its white paper, and across the country, First Nations are asserting their rights. They make their strongest cases in the courts. In British Columbia, Frank Calder and the Nishka Tribal Council claim ancestral territorial rights over the Nass Valley. The Nassara people are not on trial in this issue. The Indians in British Columbia are not on trial. British justice is on trial. We're not going to stop. We're not going to be defeated. The Nishka lose their case, but in a landmark judgment, the Supreme Court of Canada states that Indian land rights could exist. In northern Quebec, the Cree of James Bay and the Inuit win a judgment that stops Quebec's largest hydroelectric project for a week. It leads to the first comprehensive agreement in modern history. After centuries of deprivation, Canada's First Nations will no longer be taken for granted. Governments must now negotiate with them. But progress will be slow. Canada was born a fragile compromise between its English and French populations. One hundred years later, it seems everything is falling apart. I think this whole thing could be settled so easily if they would teach their children English in school in Quebec. We wouldn't need the French language here. <laughs> The depth of misunderstanding emerges at the Lorando Dunton Commission on Bilingualism and Biculturalism. Everything that we have seen and heard has convinced us that Canada is going through the most critical period in its history since Confederation. The Commission finds that throughout Canada, including Quebec, French speaking Canadians are in a disadvantaged position. André Lorondeau is shaken by what he sees. He becomes a very anguished Federalist. The coming years will be particularly bitter. I will find myself allied with people whom I despise and I will have against me most of my friends, like René Lévesque. Life won't be much fun. Before the Commission completes its work, Lorondeau dies. 
To improve life for French-speaking Canadians, the Commission recommends that Ontario and New Brunswick become as bilingual as Quebec. In New Brunswick, things are changing. In Moncton, there's a brand new university, the largest French language university outside Quebec. But in the city of Moncton, resistance to bilingualism is particularly fierce. One third of the city's population is French speaking. In 1968, some students led by Bernard Gauvin decide to press for bilingual municipal services. Irène Doiron, the sixth of eight children, is the first of her family to seek a higher education. We were influenced by the Quiet Revolution in Quebec, also by the Vietnam War. There was this awareness that there were all kinds of things in the world that weren't right. At City Hall, they confront Mayor Leonard Jones. So all members of my council understand English, and I'd ask you to confine your remarks to English so we can all understand what's being said, okay? What is your name, please? Irene Dwaron. I would like to ask you if you permit me to say my report in French. No, I can't understand French, and all members of my council understand English. I you can't... speak pretty good English. Well, I couldn't translate exactly my text in English. Well, I couldn't understand your French, either. Uh, that's the problem of bilingualism, I believe. Yes, Mountain well, if you're going to a bilingual university, you should be able to tell us. Well, right? University of Mountain is officially a French university. Oh, I see. I didn't know that. The students are humiliated. I don't know why I even said my name in English, darn it. I can't believe it. It will be a struggle, but New Brunswick will become an officially bilingual province. In 1969, Parliament passes the Official Languages Act, which gives the English and French languages equal status in all federal institutions. I believe in this conception of Canada, a federal one, a bilingual one, and I will fight for it. In Quebec, the situation is different. There is growing public pressure to make French the common language spoken by everyone. Especially in Montreal, where most immigrants choose to learn English. The first language battle breaks out in the Montreal suburb of saint Leonard, where a third of the population is of Italian origin. Your second word since the end of the Second World War, their children have been attending English or bilingual schools. Je sais parler anglais puis français, puis je veux que mes enfants ils apprennent euh, aussi tout anglais puis français. Je suis pas pour un puis pas pour l'autre, je suis pour les deux bilingues. The local school board abolishes teaching in English and forces all children to attend French schools. Raymond Lemieux, a French parent, leads the movement. The Italians see it as a betrayal, but most of all as a threat to their survival in North America. The first week of September 1969 is different from previous years. That week, the simmering dispute explodes. Lemieux's group is meeting. Some Italian parents and their supporters are there too. The publisher of an Italian language newspaper, Nick Ciamara, is one of them. I don't know who started it, but people from both groups started shoving each other. Fortunately, policemen stepped in to separate the belligerents, but Somebody had time to hit Mr. Lemieux with a chair. A 
week later, it spills into the street. Le Mieux holds a huge demonstration. It turns ugly. The mayor of saint Leonard reads the riot act. 39 people are arrested, among them Raymond Lemieux. The status of the French language will become the political cause of a whole generation of Quebecers. And Montreal will be the battleground for decades to come. In the spring of 1970, the FLQ is getting ready to strike again. Lise Balsay and Paul Rose rent a very ordinary little house south of Montreal. We showed up as a couple, Paul and Lise Blais. We were looking for an isolated house in an area where the neighbors weren't too nosy. We were going to use it as our base of operations. The country will be plunged into its worst crisis since the Second World War. It begins in early October. The FLQ kidnaps British diplomat James Cross from his house in Montreal. The kidnappers threaten to kill Cross unless the government releases 23 prison inmates they describe as political prisoners. I said that you people should stop calling them political prisoners. They're not political prisoners. They're outlaws. They're, they're, they're criminal, uh, criminal prisoners. They're not political prisoners. And they're bandits. That's why they're in jail. Five days later, another blow. The cell led by Paul Rose kidnaps Quebec's Minister of Labour, Pierre Laporte. Now there's a real sense of crisis. The FLQ seems well organized. The police forces powerless. Laporte is detained in the little house Lise Balsay and Paul Rose rented a few months before. La station radiophonique CKAC de Montréal euh, vient de recevoir un troisième communiqué émis par le Fonds de libération du Québec, particulièrement par la cellule de financement Chénier. Donc un communiqué accompagné d'une lettre adressée euh, de la main de M. Pierre Laporte adressée à M. Bourassa. The kidnapping puts tremendous pressure on the young Quebec premier. Pierre Laporte is his senior cabinet minister. Bourassa turns to Ottawa for help. The federal government sends in the army to protect politicians and important buildings. Canada has never seen anything like this before. For Pierre Trudeau, a lifelong champion of individual rights, this is a defining moment. Sir, what is it with all these uh, men with guns around here? Well, there's a lot of bleeding hearts around who just don't like to see people with helmets and guns. All I can say is uh, go on and bleed, but it's more important to keep law and order in this society than to uh, uh, be worried about uh, weak-kneed people who uh, don't like the looks of, uh, of a soldier. At any camera. cost? At any cost? How far would you go with that? How far would you extend that? Well, just watch me. The FLQ has support. 3,000 people crowd into the Paul Sauvé arena. The FLQ's lawyer, Robert Lemieux, fires them up. On va s'organiser intelligemment. On va choisir nos terrains et nous vaincrons! Bourassa and Montreal Mayor Jean Drapeau now believe they are facing an apprehended insurrection. They ask the federal government to act immediately. The government, following an analysis of the facts, including the requests of the government of Quebec and of the city of Montreal for urgent action, decided to proclaim the War Measures Act. It did so at 4 a.m. this morning, in order to permit the full weight of government to be brought quickly to bear on all those persons advocating or practicing violence as a means of achieving political ends. This law has never been invoked in peacetime. 
It suspends basic civil rights and liberties. It allows police searches and arrests without warrants and prolonged detentions without charges and without the right to see a lawyer. Hundreds of raids and arrests begin immediately. In the middle of the night, police show up at the home of singer Pauline Julien. They didn't ask us anything. I refused to stay in the living room during their search. I told them, you are in my house, I'm going with you everywhere. They didn't behave that badly. They weren't as brutal as I had heard they were elsewhere. She and her companion, leftist journalist Gérald Godin, are arrested. Why was I in jail? If only they had questioned me, I might have had an inkling. What had I said? What had I written or published? Pauline Julien and many other women are locked up in Montreal's Tongay prison. All contact with the outside world is forbidden. A warden offers some help. She told us, I can make phone calls for you, but I can't say who I am, nor where you are. All I can do is ask those people whose name you give me to take care of your cats or your children. Only Tommy Douglas and his new Democratic Party openly oppose the War Measures Act. And when you give these kind of powers uh, to local authorities, you no longer know what use or abuse they're going to make of those parts. This is what troubles us. But during the early days, Canadians overwhelmingly support the federal government, even in Quebec, where almost all of the arrests occur. On the night of October 17th, an FLQ communique leads police to a car parked near St. Hubert Airport. The 13-day drama that Canadians have been living is over. The Minister of Labour and Immigration of the province of Quebec, Pierre Laporte, was found dead tonight in the trunk of a car found near St. Hubert Airport. It is the first assassination of a Canadian politician since the murder of Thomas Darcy McGee 102 years earlier. Lise Balsay did not take part in the kidnappings. She is in the lower St. Lawrence region when she and a group of FLQ sympathizers are arrested. The radio was on and somewhere between Matan and Quebec City, I heard the bulletin that they had found Pierre Laporte's body. I felt bad and, at the same time, a bit weird. At that time, we were revolutionaries. So for me, Laporte's death was an execution, not a murder. Tuesday, October 20th, is one of the darkest days in Montreal's long history. In less than three weeks, a whole political culture has changed. Until then, politicians in Canada went about with no protection. Now they become less accessible. There will be a greater distance between the elected and the governed. Pierre Laporte's killers are arrested a few months later. The police will find and free James Cross after 60 days of captivity. It is the end of the FLQ. Pauline Julien and Gérald Godin are detained for eight days, then released without charge. It will be the same for more than 440 others. Pierre Trudeau and Robert Bourassa will express no regret for having invoked the War Measures Act. But later, they will concede that there were excesses. In the early 1970s, many women are angry. They will no longer be patronized or put off. I have the same brain uh, capacity as you have. 
just because I have to, by nature, have the child, doesn't mean that that makes me a good person to be in the home with that child. I will not stay in the home just because a man says that I should. Indian woman has been the workhorse, the doormat, and the baby machine. A royal commission on the status of women channels that anger. Journalist Doris Anderson notes the commission is a wake-up call for a lot of people. People thought it was ridiculous. A royal commission on women? What's the matter? Women are fine. The papers reported on it as a joke, but people quickly began to realize that this wasn't a joke at all. Women of Canada answer with fire the blood of their sisters. Thousands of women become activists. The decriminalization of abortion soon becomes one of their main issues. We will go ahead from here and we will speak for the women of Canada and we will do further actions until each woman has her right to control her own life. Therapeutic abortions are legal, but very few are performed. A woman has to make her case to a board of doctors and the doctors are the ones who decide. Pressure to change this is growing. Marcy Cohen is a student at Simon Fraser University in British Columbia. Women still had to go to a psychiatrist and say, I'm psychologically unstable, and so you have to give me an abortion. A Montreal doctor, Henry Morgenthaler, publicly calls for abortion on demand. We believe that any woman should have the right to ask for a termination of pregnancy within the first three months of pregnancy. He openly begins to practice illegal abortions at his clinic in East End, Montreal. There, he develops a safe abortion procedure. The Vancouver Women's Caucus is leaving today on this abortion cavalcade and is joining with women all across Canada in a nationwide struggle. In the spring of 1970, Marcy Cohen and a group of women set off for Ottawa to demand the right to abortion on demand. We were 14, 15 women. There was a yellow Pontiac convertible, a Volkswagen bus with a coffin strapped to the top. Their trek receives nationwide media coverage and they gather support everywhere they go. It was incredible. Across the country, waitresses in restaurants, for instance, would open up to us and tell us stories about what they've gone through. We picked up some women along the way from Saskatoon and Winnipeg. Some women came from Toronto and Montreal. So we had 500 to 1,000 women with us in Ottawa. They have asked for a meeting with Prime Minister Trudeau, but have received no reply. So they decide to show up at his residence. We all started a spontaneous march on Sussex Drive. There were four policemen there, but no big fences or anything. We rang the doorbell. We put the coffin down in front of his door. Nothing happens. Three years later, Henry Morgenthaler directly challenges the government, the police, and the courts. From 1968, I have performed 5,000 abortions in my clinic in Montreal in defiance of the abortion law, which I consider to be unjust, unfair, restrictive. That galvanizes the large movement of people against abortions. We're here for many days and we're going to stay here as long as we can to try and reduce the number of abortions, to try and put Dr. Morgenthaler out of business, and if possible, uh, to have him in jail. 
The authorities decide to act. Morgenthaler is arrested. Je vais laisser ma peau même pour cette lutte. Parce que je trouve que c'est une lutte pour la justice, pour la dignité des femmes, pour la protection de la santé des femmes. The Morgenthaler case will drag on for 10 years. Even though he testifies he performed abortions, juries will acquit him three times. In the next years, women will broaden their fight to include paid maternity leave, daycare, and salaries equal to those of male colleagues. In the early 70s, many Canadians are living in a dream world. The great economic post-war boom is over. But no one seems to notice. Canadians are comfortable with their illusions. It's the series of the century. In 1972, Canada's best faced the best of the Soviet Union. It's supposed to be a piece of cake for the Canadians, but the Soviets hang on almost to a bitter end, and then... Henderson made a wild stab work fell. Here's another shot, right by the shore! For a long while, Canadians will still believe they have the best hockey players in the world. I mean, God was on our side, let's face it. Everyone seems to believe the prosperity has no end and the public purse no bottom. In Quebec, this leads to the largest strike in Canada's history. More than 200,000 government employees, including hospital workers, strike. They want everyone to share the wealth. Louisette Laforêt is a nurse in a hospital near Montreal. We were asking for $100 a week basic salary for all union workers. We nurses were making more than that a week, but we wanted justice for the others. The government is running a deficit. It legislates an end to the strike. There was a lot of tension. We had no strike fund. I was a single parent, but despite the tension and the insecurity, I never thought for a moment that we should end the strike. Three union leaders urge strikers to ignore the law. It's an open challenge to Premier Robert Bourassa. Tant que je serai chef du gouvernement, il n'y aura personne au-dessus de la loi. Et ce ne sont pas les menaces qui me sont faites actuellement par les trois chefs syndicaux qui vont ébranler ma détermination et ma fermeté et mon acharnement même à faire respecter la loi. The government breaks the strike. The three union leaders are sentenced to a year in jail. Workers like Louisette Laforêt find the showdown only whets their appetite. The Common Front shook the government. I came out of it more dedicated than ever to the union movement. It's an event half a world away that drives reality home. In 1973, the Middle East is at war. Arab countries use oil as a weapon against countries supporting Israel. Oil prices quadruple. The economic fallout is immediate and devastating. Inflation reaches 11%. Unemployment skyrockets. The auto industry is especially vulnerable. Hubert Butler is still working at the Ford plant in Windsor. Butler is convinced he's going to be laid off. A lot of people were losing their jobs. I was on the afternoon shift, and I was supposed to be done at 11.30. Then they came to me and cancelled the layoff. <laughs> That's how your life can change. Governments are deeply mired in debt. 
In 1975, Pierre Trudeau resorts to a policy he was ridiculing only a year earlier. Wages and prices are frozen. This program of restraint is the heaviest imposed upon Canadians since the Second World War. Canadians are furious. I'm asking you how much you're going to do without. How much will your kids do without? Hope they don't do without anything. Okay, how about the rest of us? How about the working people here? Why should we do without? But not everybody is hurting. Alberta has oil, lots of oil. Many there are making huge fortunes. Bob Braun is president of Turbo Resources of Calgary, which owns a chain of service stations. In Turbo, we felt that anything was possible unless there was a rule against it. We just wanted to build a big company. And we started in Calgary and Edmonton, and we expanded across the prairies and into Ontario. In the East, resentment grows. Some start referring to Albertans and their premier, Peter Lougheed, as blue-eyed Arabs. While Alberta prospers, eastern provinces have to pay world prices for imported oil. Ottawa asks western oil companies to voluntarily freeze their prices. And it imposes a tax on western oil exports to the United States. We intend to fight back. We have no other choice. Albertans feel that Ottawa wants to stop them from selling their oil at a fair price and force them to send it east. It's our resource, so we should uh, get the say in who we sell it to and for what. Westerners like Bob Braun turn not only against Trudeau, but against the federal government. His vision of a strong central government is not how this country was founded. It's not the basis on which we exist, certainly in Western Canada. Alberta and the Trudeau government begin a tug of war that will last 10 years. It will deepen the split between East and West. In 1973, René Lévesque has had enough. He is leaving politics. I have done my bit. It's time to hang up my skates. I feel like earning a decent living like everyone else. There must be others who can take my place. In the recent election, his Parti Québécois lost ground to the Liberals, and once again, Lévesque failed to get elected. Louisette Laforêt, an early member of the PQ, is devastated. I cried. I was so disappointed. It was very painful. After what Bourassa had done to the unions, I was hoping things would change. Lévesque's departure would be catastrophic. His supporters search for something that will convince him to change his mind. Claude Morin is a backroom advisor who has wielded power in Quebec for years. He thinks he has the answer. He proposes a new strategy. Get elected first, then hold a referendum on independence. He calls it étapism, one step at a time. Le mot étapisme est un mot qui a été inventé pour décrire euh, tout simplement le fait qu'on ne peut pas faire la souveraineté du Québec du jour au lendemain. Ça, c'est normal. Tout le monde comprend ça. Lévesque buys the idea and decides to stay. In the next election, a vote for the Parti Québécois will not be a vote for Quebec's independence. Then the PQ gets lucky. Robert Bourassa's liberal government goes off the rails. First, it stumbles over the thorny language issue. It makes French the official language of Quebec and requires that French appear on commercial signs. It limits access to English schools to children who already speak English. The law pleases no one. Publisher Nick Chiamara is a liberal supporter. It was a good law, but many non-Francophones felt cheated. 
they felt they were losing the right to send their children to the school of their choice. Quebec nationalists like Louisette Laforêt feel Borassa hasn't done enough. It did nothing to protect the French language. To me, it was a betrayal by the Liberal government and most of all, by Robert Bourassa. Then there are long and violent strikes. In Montreal, a firefighter's strike will be remembered as the Red Weekend. The government is splattered by scandals connected with the construction of the Olympic installations. But a decision in Ottawa will give the Parti Québécois its biggest boost. Ottawa wants to make air traffic control at five Quebec airports bilingual. English-speaking pilots and air traffic controllers won't have it. It's uh, unsafe and everyone's proven that. Uh, I can't understand what the, what the problem is. But French-speaking pilots and controllers see it as overdue. It's being done in all countries of the world, and I think one of the good examples is uh, the uh, Paris area, where 60% uh, of the traffic is in French and 40% in English. The federal government retreats from the idea of bilingual airports. Transport Minister Jean Marchand has been the driving force behind the policy. Disillusioned, he quits cabinet. But I think that this very serious problem of national unity is not going to be solved in Alberta. It's going to be solved in Quebec. Gérard Pelletier has already left government. Of the three wise men, only Trudeau remains. In the fall of 1976, Robert Bourassa calls a snap election. Levesque plays on built-up frustration and resentment against the government. Our decision desk is calling a majority government for the Parti Québécois. Louisette Laforêt is one of thousands at the Paul Sauvé Arena that night. It was a great moment, an unforgettable moment. It was so real, you could have cut through the emotions with a knife. We finally had the feeling that Quebec would become independent, that it was finally possible. I am confident that Quebecers will continue to reject separatism because they still believe that their destiny is linked with an indivisible Canada. The struggle for the hearts, minds, and loyalties of Quebecers has begun. Twice in the decades to come, the survival of Canada will be put to the test.